close look at what you don't understand because you do need to understand this stuff. Okay? It's uh, basic uh, views of uh, the differentiability de definition, and you, you need to be able to, be, to do these computations. So read over problems that you didn't understand. Ask me what uh, you, if, if you're, you don't understand your mistakes, and uh, let's go from there. Okay? Okay, so we are still in 5.3, and um, let me uh, just recall. So the main, the main mean value theorem is what we, we call the Lagrange mean value theorem, and uh, it states the following, that uh, if you have a function f which is continuous on a, b closed and differentiable on a, b open, then there exists a c in a, b such that f of b minus f of a is equal to f prime of c times b minus a. And we talked already about this. What uh, the one way to prove this is to prove a more general mean value theorem that we call the Cauchy mean value theorem. And uh, then apply the Cauchy mean value theorem to the special function f, and the other function would be g of x equal x. So we talked about that already. Now, there are several uh, important applications of this mean value theorem that we are going to see. Uh, first thing, as I mentioned already, there is a, an easy consequence of this theorem, which is called the Rolle's theorem, which is when, so it's a particular case when f of b is equal to f of a, then there is c in a b such that f prime of c is equal to zero. This particular application of a mean value theorem turns out to be useful in a number of cases. So. Okay, so it's the same hypothesis as here. f is continuous, differentiable. Then, uh, and in addition, you have f of b equal to f of a. You end up with f prime of c equals. Okay, so now we can uh, move on to applications of this. Uh, yes, first. Oh, before I do that, maybe, yeah. Let's, let's do one example uh, about the number of solutions. Uh, let's look at the following equation. Okay, let's say we want to show that x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus 1 has at most two real solutions. Now that I look at it from here, it doesn't look like a very interesting example. It's not interesting at all because this is really x squared plus 1 to the square. Okay, so I don't need to do a lot to see that this is never zero. Okay, I'll come back with something else. Just put that one on the test, though, if you like. Well, it's misleading. You don't want something like that because 
you are going to lose your balance and then it's going to be a disaster on the rest. So no, it's not a good advice. So let's move on to null derivative. Uh, what the point here is that many times uh, when the equation is not trivial as this one, you, you don't, it's complicated to have an algebraic method to find the solutions. Okay, it's possible up to uh, the fifth degree, but uh, it may be very time consuming. So sometimes you just want to know how many solutions you have. And there, uh, Rolle's theorem is handy because you have a function which is continuous because we are talking about uh, a polynomial. And you know that it's, so to count the number of solutions, you look at, you know, you do, like here, you would do proof by contradiction. Let's assume that we have three solutions. Then you have an A where it's, your function is zero, you have a B where your function is zero, and you have a C where your function is zero. So between A and B, you know that F prime must be zero somewhere, according to, to Rolle's theorem. And between B and C, it's also zero somewhere. And now you use Rolle's theorem on F prime. And it tells you that F second should be zero somewhere. But then it turns out that your F second is never zero and then you, you get your contradiction. So that's, that's how you would use that. But I'll, I'll give you a good example where it's actually proving something. Okay, so let's, let's go on with uh, uh, the null uh, derivative and let's assume the following. So <coughs> assume that f is differentiable on the open interval i. Then f is constant on i if and only if f prime is identically 0 on i. So, first thing, if f is constant, so one implication we have talked already about, if f is constant on i, a constant function has a derivative which is zero. That comes from the definition of uh, the derivative. Uh, when you do your, your f of a plus h minus f of a, you get zero all the time. So you divide by h and you let h go to zero, you still get to zero. So the derivative is zero. That's not a problem. Now the converse is, so this time assume that f prime is zero on i. So f prime of x is equal to 0 for every x in i. Now, take any a and b in i, then f is uh, continuous on a, b, and differentiable on a, b. See, because remember, i is open, so you have i somewhere like this, and your a is here, and your b is here. Okay, a and b must be inside your interval because it's an open interval. So you, if you are in the open interval, it means that there is some room around you. Okay? You cannot be at the boundary of an open interval and be in the interval. That's not possible. Therefore, uh, because you know that your function is differentiable at A, certainly it's continuous at A and it's continuous at B. Okay? And it's differentiable on A, B, open. Okay? So there is no, I'm just using the fact that I know that my function is differentiable at every point of the open interval A, uh, I. That's all I'm using. 
So I can use the mean value theorem. And write that this is f prime of c times b minus a for some c in a b. Okay. But f prime of c is 0. That's our assumption. We're assuming that f prime is 0 everywhere on i. So because c belongs to i, and it belongs to i because a and b belong to i, so c is in somewhere between a and b, therefore it must be in i, then uh, f prime of c must be 0. And that tells us that f of b minus f of a is 0, which means that f of b is f of a. So we have taken any two points a and b and shown that f of a is equal to f of b. f must be a constant. Okay. If you're not convinced, do a proof by contradiction. Assume that f is not constant, then it means that uh, your f should take at least two different values. But according to what we just did, you take any two points, you get always the same value. So that's not possible. Okay. Another application of uh, uh, the mean value theorem is to look at uh, monotone functions. So let's define these functions first. So definition f is strictly increasing on i if x less than y implies f of x strictly less than f of y. f is increasing on i if x less than y implies f of x less than equal to f of y. And f is decreasing on i if x less than y implies f of x larger than f of y. I'll let you imagine what strictly decreasing is. Okay, so. Now, what's, what's the relation between increasing and differentiability? Uh, well, you know that in calculus, you know that the sign of the derivative tells you the, whether your function is increasing or decreasing on a certain interval. So as for sequences, a monotone sequence, a monotone function on i is increasing or decreasing function on i. It cannot do both, of course. It's either increasing or decreasing on i, and then you call it a monotone function. OK, so uh, let's assume that f is differentiable on the open interval if f 
prime is strictly positive on I, then F is strictly increasing on I. And if F prime is negative on I, then F is strictly decreasing on I. Okay, so uh, for instance, uh, assume that F prime is strictly increasing on I. Uh, then take X is less than Y in I. And again, uh, you have that f is continuous on x, y, and differentiable on x, y, open. So the Lagrange mean value term applies. And we get that f of x minus f of y is f prime of c x minus y for some c in x, y. Now, since f prime is strictly positive on i, we have that f prime of c is strictly positive on i, is strictly positive. And if, it's, if f prime of c is strictly positive, it means that f prime of c times x minus y is strictly negative. That's because I'm assuming that x is strictly less than y. Okay, so I'm multiplying by a positive number, doesn't, doesn't change the sign. But if, prime, if f prime of c times x minus y is strictly less than zero, it means that f of x minus f of y is also strictly negative because both quantities are equal. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to show that f of x is strictly less than f of y. When we are done. We have shown that f is strictly increasing. Now, for f prime uh, negative, strictly negative, you do exactly the same thing, uh, except that this time you are going to have a negative f prime of c. So that's going to invert your sign, and that's why you get a decreasing function instead. Okay? Now, uh, the, the observation which <coughs> So an important remark is the following, if f prime is positive or zero on i, then f is increasing on i. And that's one of your homework problems. So I won't spoil it for you and won't do it for the time being. 
Uh, however, it may also be strictly increasing. You don't know. Okay? So it's increasing, that's for sure. But it's possible, it's possibly also strictly increasing. Okay? And you'll be asked to find an example like that, where your derivative is not strictly positive, it has point where it's a zero, but where but your function is strictly increasing. So the point here is that the, the, the strict inequalities don't really correspond. Okay? If you have a strict inequality for the derivative, you do get strictly increasing. But if you have a large inequality for your derivative, it may be strict, strictly increasing or not. It's certainly increasing. Okay? And same thing for decreasing, of course. Now, uh, how important is this interval business? Okay, everywhere we, we write the mean value term is for intervals, uh, open intervals. We are all the time talking about intervals. So let's, let's see that it's quite crucial, actually. Uh, and on a very simple example, let's look at f of x equal to 1 over x, which is defined on minus infinity 0, union 0, positive infinity. This is not an interval because it has a hole at zero. This is an interval and this is an interval, but the union of the two is not an interval. So I can apply my theorem on this part or on this part. What I cannot do is use the theorem on the whole thing. And I shouldn't because it would give me a wrong result as we're going to see. So let's look at this. When we do f prime of x, we get minus 1 over x squared. And this is, of course, strictly negative on d. This is always a strictly negative thing. So if I'm not careful, I'll say, well, f prime is strictly negative. My function is strictly decreasing. Not true. My function f is not decreasing on d because of the following. However, f is not decreasing on d. And I can see this by simply looking at f of minus 1 is minus 1, f of 1 is 1. So we have minus 1 less than 1, of course, and f of minus 1 less than f of 1. So this is increasing in this case. But of course, it's neither. Because then I can say f of 2 is half. And then I have, of course, that 1 is less than 2. And f of 2 is less than f of 1. So this would indicate that it's actually a decreasing function. But when I put the two uh, inequalities together, I see that it's not decreasing nor increasing on D, okay? So F is not decreasing nor increasing on D. But what we can say is that f is decreasing and strictly decreasing on minus infinity 0. That's the property we just saw. Okay, I have an open interval. I compute my derivative. It's strictly decreasing. It's strictly negative. Therefore, my function is decreasing. Okay? And I can also say that f is strictly decreasing on 0 positive infinity. That's also a true statement. 
But what's not a true statement is F is decreasing on the union of these two guys, as we can see there. Okay, so you can conclude things about intervals, no problem. Not about anything else, or not, not using at least this result, because that depends very strongly on the fact that you are on an interval. And it's a single point which prevents us of having an interval. I mean, you could think you could throw it away. Not always, sometimes, but not in this case. Questions? Okay, yeah, then there are these different tests about how to find, that's another uh, homework problem you have, which is to show that it's not true that if your derivative is zero at A, then you have an extremum at A. Okay, there are counterexamples, of course. So that's not a true statement. However, by looking at the derivative, I still should be able to say whether I have a local extremum or not, and that's what we're going to do next. Um, so, in particular, let's look at this example. Let's assume that f is differentiable on open interval i. And let delta a positive number such that a minus delta, a plus delta, is included in i. Uh, and a, OK, I'm not going to i. Let's take a in i. And then let's take delta so that this is a true statement. And then uh, let's assume the following, that if for, so assume also that for x in a minus delta a, uh, f prime of x is positive. And then for x in uh, a, a plus delta, f prime of x is negative. Then we want to show that f has a local maximum at a. So we can actually look at this like this, where we have the a minus delta a, a plus delta. Then we have f prime. So we are told that f prime is positive here, negative here. And then we can look at f, and it's increasing here and therefore decreasing here. So of course, uh, it, it's going to have a local maximum. Okay? You may have seen this in your childhood. Uh, it's the first derivative test okay, to find a, a maximum. How do we prove that? How do we prove that the picture is actually correct? Well. Um, Again, we, the mean value theorem is handy for this type of question. And uh, what we are going to do is write, OK, first take x 
in a minus delta a and write that f of a minus, well, f of x minus f of a is f prime of c times x minus a for c in uh, a minus delta a. Okay, because it's exactly the same situation as always. We have a differentiable function of the open interval i. You take two points, you can apply the mean value theorem between the two points. Uh, what does this tell me? Well, f prime of c, so uh, f prime of c must be positive, right? We, that's what you're assuming. So uh, f of x minus f of a, which is f prime of c times x minus a, is also strictly positive which tells me that f of x is bigger than f of a for all x in a minus delta a. So we get this. Now we look on the other side. We take now y in a a plus delta, and we write the mean value term again for f of y minus f of a equal to y minus a times f prime of d, where d belongs to a a plus delta. But in a, a plus delta, we are assuming that we have negative derivative. Therefore, f prime of d is negative, uh, which means that y minus a, f prime of d is also negative, which means then that f of y minus f of a is negative. That's not what I want. What happened here? Uh, x was, no, x was smaller. This is what's wrong. OK. My x is smaller than a, right? I'm taking x in a minus delta a. So uh, this is a negative quantity. Because x minus a is negative, and I'm multiplying by a positive number, so it stays negative. And therefore, this is negative too. f of x is less than f of a. <coughs> I had a physics teacher like that. She would change signs at the end, and everything would be fine. <laughs> That wasn't the model for me when I started, but looks like. OK, so we get f of y less than f of a for all y in a, a plus delta. So now we can put things together, you see, because everybody is less than f of a in my interval a minus delta a plus delta. OK, I look at this. And I look at this, and now I can say, well, I can say that for all x in a minus delta, a plus delta, f of uh, x is less than f of a. So a is a local maximum. Got a hole in the 
it has a hole? Yeah, because x cannot be equal to a in that case. Why not? Because then f Oh, is oh, good point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what we have shown actually is for all x different from a in a minus delta a plus delta, we have a strict inequality. If we want to, to write what was written before, we need to put a large inequality. So are you in the mood for a second derivative test? OK. So let's do that. Okay, so This time we assume that f and f prime are differentiable on the open interval i. Uh, we take a in i and we know that f prime of a is 0. And f second of a is strictly negative. Then f has a local maximum at a. So proof of that So first thing let's define the following function let the phi be defined by uh, phi of h is equal to f prime of a plus h minus f prime of a over h uh, for h different from 0. And phi of 0 is f second of a. First step, uh, phi is continuous at zero. Why? Why is phi a continuous function at zero? Can I compute the limit? Uh, it's because f prime is differentiable at a, right? Because when I when I take the limit here, I know the limit exists because f prime is differentiable at a, and the derivative of f prime at a is f second of a. Okay, so we can write that limit as h goes to zero 
of f prime of a plus h minus f prime of a over h is f second of a. Yes? Okay. Now, this is, by our definition, uh, C of zero. So the limit, so, and this is also the limit of phi of h as h goes to zero. So the limit of phi of h as h goes to zero is phi of zero. Okay, that's, a, that's enough to show that phi is a continuous function at zero. So that's our first step. Can we say that, um, I mean, I guess because f prime is differentiable everywhere, or on, on the open interval A, can we say that that automatically means that phi is going to be continuous on the open interval I? Uh, you need to do a translation because you, uh, you are, you see, every time you are doing A plus H minus f prime of A. And so your phi is defined locally. The problem you have is that if your A is very close to the boundary of phi, you, you want your H to be small, to be near zero. So, so it's a local definition. It's not something global. But what you can do is for every A, find a phi that has these properties. That's, that's what you can do. OK, so that's the first point. Now, the uh, second thing is that okay. yes. So the, now the second step Uh, there is delta which is positive and such that for h, for all h in minus delta delta, uh, phi of h is negative. So how are we going to show, to show that? What do we know about the sign of phi of 0? What's phi of 0? The second derivative. The second derivative is negative. So I have a second derivative which is negative. And I need something else, actually. Uh, I also need to know that my second derivative is continuous. Because if my continuous function is strictly negative at a, I know that I can find a small interval around a where the function is going to be strictly negative. We have seen that already. OK? That's a consequence of continuity. So really, uh, I'm missing a hypothesis here. So we need this, and we also need f second is continuous at a. No, because then it, uh, that, all that gives to you is f prime is continuous at a. You won't have second continuous at a. You don't get that. You could have a derivative which is not a continuous function. That happens. So we are here, and the reason, the, the way to proceed is the following. Phi of 0 is f second of a. Oh.
Okay, so phi of zero is f second of a and is, by assumption, is strictly negative. Now, what we want to say is the following. Let's write that, that phi is continuous at zero. This was type one. Phi is continuous at zero, which means that, so let's write, uh, let's write an epsilon delta pro, uh, definition of being continuous at zero, because this is useful for this. Uh, so for any epsilon, there is a delta so that if h minus zero is less than delta, then f of uh, phi of h minus phi of zero is less than epsilon. Okay, the usual trick to get inequalities. Okay, I'll have to raise this. And we get that phi of h is between uh, phi of 0 minus epsilon and phi of 0 plus epsilon for all h in minus delta delta. OK? Now, what should I take for my epsilon to make this work? What should I take for my epsilon so that I end up with what we want, which is phi of h strictly negative? It's negative phi of 0, which is the strictly positive number, since phi of 0 is negative. So let's take epsilon equal this, and we get phi of h less than Phi my, uh, so what do we have here? F uh, minus phi of 0 over 2 plus phi of 0, which is phi of 0 over 2, and that's strictly negative. So phi of h is going to be strictly negative. OK? You look less enthusiastic about the second derivative test now. But we are almost done. Yes. So what happens then? Uh, Oh, OK. Uh, so actually, I take back my uh, uh, additional hypothesis F sec, that f second is to be continuous at 0. We haven't used at A. We have not used that. Okay? So the original statement is correct. We don't need uh, an, an additional assumption on f second. Now, uh, step three, we're going to show that f prime of a plus h is uh, negative for all h in minus delta 0. And that's easy. That's easy because phi of h 
is, remember by definition, it's f prime of a plus h minus f prime of a over h. That's what phi of h is. But remember, one hypothesis we have not used yet is that f prime of a is 0, okay, in order to use a second derivative test. So f prime of a is 0, we end up with f prime of a plus h over h. But this guy here is negative. And the ratio phi we say in this interval is positive. So it means that this guy here must be negative. That's the only solution. So we get this. Now, uh, step four is going to be the symmetric thing. F prime of A plus H is going to be positive for o H in zero delta. You do exactly the same thing. You say here of H is F prime of A plus H over H. And it's positive. I know it's positive because phi is positive in minus delta delta. But this time, this guy is positive. So this one must be positive too. So now we are back to the first derivative test. Okay? Now, yeah. Unless we feel like reproving it. I don't. So, no. So step five is use the, f the first derivative test. Because you know that, what do we know? Yeah, you know that f prime is so we have our x here, we have a minus delta, we have a, we have a plus delta. We know that f prime is negative and then positive. Bad news. But do we have an excuse to do that? That's a question. Uh, why is this wrong? Huh. H is negative, isn't it? It's negative, and I do want, oh, oh, you should have stopped me. Phi of h is not positive. Phi of h is negative. Isn't it what we proved in step uh, n? Okay, so that's why we have the inverse, uh, the other side. Phi of h is negative. Sorry about that. It was a bad mistake here. Because this is positive, and then we do negative here, and then positive. Uh, then it must be. This must be negative, positive, so this is negative too. Sorry about that. So we have the signs right here. This is positive, this is negative. And then this is increasing, decreasing. And the first derivative test tells you that here you must have a local maximum. Now, in terms of application, the second derivative test is easier to use usually. Not easier to prove, as you can say, as, we can, as you have seen, but easier to, to, to use because you compute your first derivative and you check the points for which you get to zero. And then you compute your second derivative at this point and you see what the sign is. And that gives you whether you have a local maximum or local minimum. Okay, so 
in that sense, it's a useful tool in calculus. OK. So I. What? Potentially neither if the first or if the second derivative is equal to zero. Exactly. If the second derivative is equal to zero, to you cannot conclude. Things. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So let's stop here for today. Homework uh, uh, was assigned already yeah. for yeah. this section. Oh, but actually you are right. No, no. I need to assign more homework. Okay. Have to kill you, yeah, for the following week, yes. So, eight. Thank you.